Hi, this is Ethan Tapper, the Chittenden County Forester, um, and I'm here with David Paganelli, the Orange County Forester, to demonstrate a forest management technique that's called crop tree release. And we're out here at Clover Hill Tree Farm in South Stratford. Yep. And David, you tell us a little bit about the site we're this on? This is part of a 200-acre tree farm. It was uh, agricultural land from approximately 1795 until maybe the 1970s when these trees that you see regenerate. And the soils are rich, they're rich in calcium. Sugar maple is dominant in the forest around here and so most of the young trees here are sugar maples. And, uh, but they're, they're young, which presents an opportunity to do pre-commercial work, either thinning or crop tree release, to favor the best trees and uh, encourage them to grow faster. One of the really neat things about crop tree release is it's a technique that can be utilized on lots of different types of forests and it's a technique that helps us work in the woods a little bit more efficiently. I know that when I started working as a forester and I got a paint gun in my hand I was marking trees to be cut, I was thinking about every tree that I felt like needed to be cut. So it would be uh, a tree with a defect or a tree with something wrong with it. Um, the, what the crop tree release method does is it flips this on its head and instead of thinking about what needs to go, it thinks about what needs to grow. And so instead of um, cutting every tree that has something wrong with it, we're instead clearing around our highest quality trees. So David, what's a, what's a crop tree? A crop tree is a tree that I want to grow. And, and for you, a crop tree would be a tree that you want to grow. And they might not be the same trees. And that's okay. For me, if I have a cherry in this in this sugar maple mix, and it's a healthy tree, I want to grow it. If I have a red oak, I want to grow it for diversity as well as for wildlife habitat, as well as high quality sugar maple stems or yellow birch. When I choose the trees that I, that I want to uh, have as my crop trees, I'm looking at several factors, species, uh, quality, and structural integrity. If you, have, if you have a beautiful, healthy tree, but it goes up and it has a narrow fork with a seam at the bottom, that's a tree that's going to break at some point. You'll, you'll have an ice storm, you know, next winter, the winter after, 10 years later, somewhere along the way, that tree's going to split apart and break. That's not a tree I want to invest any time into. There are, are different kinds of crop trees. So a paper birch might be a, uh, an aesthetic crop tree. I like the way it looks. That's why it's a crop tree. Or you could have a black cherry or a red oak. Those might be wildlife crop trees, but you also have timber crop trees. So this is a this is a sugar maple. Sugar maple is a very valuable timber species, and it's a tree that is fairly straight with a single trunk. So it's got it's got good form. So with with this tree, we have a relatively big crown. Uh, foresters talk about live crown ratio. So if you took the the total length of the tree, and you looked at what portion of the tree has live branches that would be the live crown. So generally, trees with a bigger live crown respond faster, release them from competition of their neighbors, and give them some space. They have the crown to immediately use that space and begin to grow in diameter. So people manage forests for all different kinds of reasons. You don't have to do all of any one thing. So we're managing for many different things. We're managing for species diversity. We're man managing for healthy forest uh, ecology, we're managing for complexity, we're managing for wildlife habitat, uh, carbon sequestration and storage. We can do all of these things at once. The crop trees that you select can be based on all different kinds of things. So I'm standing here by a black cherry. This is a tree that is uh, a crop tree not because it's a timber tree but because it has wildlife value and because in this area that has a lot of sugar maple it represents species diversity. So different species uh, perform different ecological functions. Uh, they're doing different things for the forest and so it's really important that uh, as we're managing our forest we're really trying to encourage species diversity. In the case of black cherry this is what we call a mass tree. Um, in particular it's a soft mast species. Uh, so what mast is is basically a seed, a fruit, a nut that a tree produces which is eaten by wildlife. Uh, examples of soft mast species are stuff like black cherry, um, and our other native cherries, like apple trees. Examples of hard mass species, so species that are not producing a berry but producing a nut are beech and red oak, um, hickories, 
Uh, and so in releasing our crop trees that are mass species, um, we're going to allow them to expand their crown and they're going to produce more mass for wildlife. So one of the, the really neat things about crop tree release also from a forest stewardship perspective is as a landowner, you're going to have to make a lot of choices about how you use your time to make your forest as healthy as possible. Um, so you have a limited amount of time, you have a limited amount of physical energy, and maybe you have a lot of area that you need to cover. And we want to actually be able to have a meaningful impact on our forest as a whole instead of just hyper-focusing on one little area. Sort of byproduct of the crop tree release method is that if we're only cutting trees who are competing with our crop trees, it's allowing us to leave imperfect trees to exist in the forest. So imperfect trees, trees with holes in them, trees with defects, trees with crotches, and you know things that we would consider to be sort of wrong with them are a normal part of how forests grow and develop. And as those trees uh, grow, they might be filled with cavities, holes that are excavated by woodpeckers, which are used by all kinds of different animals. They might die and fall on the forest floor. They might become dead standing trees. All of these things are things that are critical from a forest ecology perspective. So it allows us to give our, our best quality trees, our crop trees, a little bit more juice at the same time that we're allowing ecological processes that are critical to forest development to occur. Behind me we see that we're encouraging not just species diversity but also structural diversity. So allowing large trees, even though they're not valuable from a, from a financial or an economic perspective, to persist because they're valuable from uh, an ecological perspective. Crop tree release allows us to not to make our forest more simple, more regular, more homogenous, but to make it more irregular, more diverse, and more complex. While trees are competing with each other, some will, will grow slower, some will be outcompeted by others, and the ones that grow more slowly will die. This is a natural process. The benefit of releasing trees actively, like we mentioned, it could have some benefit from an economic perspective, so producing local renewable resources from our forests, which are beautiful. Um, it could have benefits from a wildlife perspective, so allowing some of our mass tree species to expand their crowns and produce more mass. Um, another uh, reason that we might want to do some of this work is that we understand that our climate is changing and that our trees are under a lot of stress. As you look into the science about how we prepare our forests to deal with a changing climate, one thing that we can do is to relieve other stresses on our forests. So that can include helping our healthy trees uh, be less stressed from competition with their neighbors so that they can deal with the other massive environmental stresses of a changing climate. So again, this, this crop tree release method is both a great way to manage our forests and is also a way to improve your efficiency when you're working in the woods. And so one thing that I tell landowners to do it, to be more efficient is to be really strict with yourself. Uh, you're going to be clearing around your crop trees and everything inside of you is going to be aching to cut that tree with a hole in it. To cut that tree that has something wrong with it. To cut that tree that, that has a big crook in it or looks like it's leaning in a way that you don't like or is, you think is ugly for some reason or something like that. And so in order for this system to work from an efficiency perspective, what you need to do is only cut trees that are competing with your crop trees. So this does a couple different things. Number one, instead of cutting all those trees you don't need to cut, uh, you can be moving on and you can be releasing more crop trees. To make our, our work more efficient, we cannot be worried about pulling every stick of wood out of the woods. So when I'm managing in my own forest um, and I'm doing crop tree release, most of the trees that I'm cutting I'm either leaving on the ground or I'm girdling like this big white pine. And so the benefit of this is that instead of spending 90% of my time fussing with, with each piece of wood trying to get it out of the woods, um, I'm spending most of my time releasing more trees. It used to be that loggers would be told in their contract that they had to cut brush up, you know, below waist height, below knee height, below three feet. I tell loggers not to cut brush up at all. While it makes the forest look more messy, uh, it more closely resembles what a natural disturbance looks like, and it provides more of those sort of ecological benefits to wildlife. The benefit of girdling trees, like this white pine, Number one, it, it kills the tree, so it, it removes it as a competing force with the adjacent trees, uh, but it retains it as a dead standing tree, which has tremendous wildlife value. 
It's also a great method for dealing with trees that uh, you don't feel are safe to fell. So if you're dealing with a big white pine tree that has a lot of different trunks that you're going to spend all day, you know, and it's going to be extremely dangerous to try and get that tree on the ground, what you could do instead is to girdle it and let the tree work itself to the ground over time. A tree like this will stand for 20 years or more. And as it breaks apart, the top branches will break first and they're fairly small and they'll fall in around the trunk itself and do very little damage. If, if I decided that I didn't want this tree here and I was gonna cut it down, I'm okay with a saw, but sometimes trees don't always go where I expect them to go. And uh, there are a lot of trees around this tree that I want to have growing space and I want to grow. And I don't want to drop this tree, you know, expecting it's going to drop over there and have it go instead over there and do all kinds of damage to the trees that I want to grow over there. By girdling it, it's, it's dead in place with five minutes of work. As I come up and, and I cut the branches off that are within kind of eye head height so that I can move around the, the tree. And then when I've got the branches on the ground, I'll start with uh, one ring, I'll go about a, an inch into the wood, I'll go through the bark about an inch into the wood and, and go make a complete circle, then I'll go down six or eight inches and do the same thing. And the, the beauty of these big trees is that usually will leave a sound stem. If this was a 10 inch tree and you did that, uh, it would probably snap off at some point. Because you think about the the crown of the tree as being a, a circle, if you look down on it and it was a circle. Um, most of these trees will tend to grow against each other and there'll be a thin space between the trees. What you want to do is, is cut the neighbors so that there is two or three or four feet of growing space for the trees to reach into and grow their crowns uh, to the side, so lateral crown growth which expands the volume of the crown, which is essentially the growth engine of the tree. Release the crown of your crop tree by conducting a crown touching release. So only cutting trees whose crowns are touching the crown of your crop tree. If they're not touching the crown of your crop tree, just leave them alone. Divide the crown of your crop tree into four quadrants and picture releasing that crop tree on at least two or three of those different quadrants. So we'd call this a two or a three-sided release. So this is my crop tree. So this tree and this tree, it's, you know, it's just over six feet away from my crop tree. Its crown is, is coming up into the bottom of my crop tree. There's really no room for this tree. You know, there might be today, but in 10 years, as each of these trees grows, there's no place for this. This is being crowded out. What David's done here is that he's gone through this area of forest that we're going to be working in, and he has designated crop trees by those, those methods that we talked about, um, and flagged them with flagging tape. There's a lot of benefits of doing it this way, one of which is you can visualize where your crop trees are, um, so that helps from a logistical perspective as you're felling trees that you're not felling trees into your crop trees and that you're also making sure that you have a good distribution of crop trees throughout an area. The, the other thing that it does is it, is it allows you to focus on one task at a time. So when I use a chainsaw, I like to focus on the chainsaw. I like to focus on safe felling techniques. And, and, uh, and I don't want to be thinking about my next crop tree while I'm using the chainsaw and be distracted. So I walk through the area, I think about which are my crop trees, I flag those trees, and then I shift gears entirely and then I'm in cutting mode.